before we go like into your like your history, just tell people listening basically what your story, why you went to pr- why you got in trouble, why did you go to prison? Uh, uh, it was a federal indictment for conspiracy to counterfeit U.S. obligations. Okay, so you were manufacturing money. Yes, selling them, passing them myself, um, and yeah, manufacturing. <laughs> Wow, and how much how much money did you create, and how did you how did you go about how did you just get into this? How did you get into making and manufacturing your own your own money? Were you making well, hundred dollar bills? Yeah, I mean, I, I did twenties and fifties, but at, at, you know, it comes to a point to where every twenty dollar bill is pointless when you could do a hundred. You know what I mean? It's just maximize the profit. Um, and you know, basically, I read uh, when I was like nineteen, I I saw this book, The Art of Making Money. Um, it's about a counterfeiter up in Chicago, Art Williams. And, you know, I read that and it just kind of <clears throat> like get a little bit closer to the money. Basically, basically, uh, you know, the, the best way to make money as far as I was concerned was making money, you know? So I just studied, you know, read as many things as I could. I read that book, which kind of inspired me to try it, you know? Um, and, uh, I took a cut, like one or two of the methods that he used, which was good methods, but I tweaked them. And um, so basically, he was uh, <clears throat> using like two pieces of paper and gluing them together to to embed a strip in a watermark. Um, so I, I went that route. That's obviously the best way to to do it. Um, there's there's a lot of people that like will take five dollar bills and bleach them and print hundreds on them, but then the strip still says USA 5, and it's a different watermark and all that. So, um, But I wanted to make them from scratch. So basically I started doing it a little bit when I was 19 or 20. I made, made some money and then just stopped. You know, I didn't want to get caught. It was just a quick thing. Um, so back when I, mo- or when I moved to Knoxville and kind of got myself in a desperate financial situation... Um, I, I knew I could fall back on that, you know what I mean? I, I, and I decided to start doing it again. Um, so, so you were good at it. Uh, that's what I've been told. When you first did it, did you like, were you more so, were you doing it specifically just cause you needed to make money or were you doing it like, Hey, let me see like if this, if I could be good at this, like this will be fun to try. Uh, or was like, it just desperation? Well, I mean, at first it was desperation, obviously, uh, like the, the at first. And then, so my plan was to kind of like, you know, make these hundreds, kind of sell them to, to people I knew for, you know, 25 cents on the dollar. So if I were to sell you $10,000, you know, you give me two grand or 2,500 for it. Um, and that was kind of my original plan was to just do that a few times to make enough money to get into a new house and, you know, you know, to live until I found another job and this and that. But, um, after I, I, I did it, you know, I, I want a, a buddy of mine that I worked with at that sign company ended up being like a, a really large drug dealer, which I didn't even know. I went over to his house one day and all this, like I knew he sold some weed, maybe a little bit of Coke. Um, but I went over to his house one day and he had like bricks of, you know, heroin, meth, cocaine, all this stuff. So basically I, I gave him the idea. I'm like, listen, I used to counterfeit. I can make these bills. And if you want to re-up in Atlanta, go down to Atlanta and re-up with your, you know, supply, you can throw some of these in there. So we kind of did that as like a trial run. He went to Atlanta, bought, I'm not sure the exact amount, but I think I gave him like 5000 in, uh, I think it was 20s at first. And it, you know, everything went fine, so um, started kind of perfecting the hundreds, um, which, so like the two, I I found that basically the best paper to use for sandwiching two sheets together was Bible paper. Um, It's really, really thin and opaque to where you could, uh, you know, print the front of a bill and the back of a bill and then on the back of the back print a strip and a watermark and then um like mist on a little bit of gorilla glue spray squeegee them together you know i had a a piece of glass with led lights behind it so you could see through the bills to line everything up um 
Wow. Squeegee them together, and then I found uh, the the counterfeit pens are a, a chemical reaction. So, so when you test a, a bill, it's a iodine-based ink. So the iodine in the in the ink reacts to starch in the paper, which turns it a black thing. So real money, it stays yellow, you know what I mean? And, and counterfeit will stay black. So I figured out that uh, spraying the bills with a, a lacquer spray, it's basically like clear spray paint, a matte lacquer, um, basically created a, a barrier, you know, and, and prevented the re- chemical reaction between the pen and the, and the paper, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'd tweak things here and there and find different methods that worked significantly well, um, like... Once you glue the bills together, uh, if you if you spray a thick coat first to, to make sure that the counterfeit pens don't, you know, react with the starch in the paper and then let that dry and then spray another coat from a distance, it kind of mists on and it gives it a texture. Um, so, like, basically, and I sometimes iron, iron the bills just a little bit to make them nice and crispy and, you know, rigid. Uh, and uh, I found uh, this iridescent green eyeshadow, um, which is basically just a color-shifting pigment that they sell as makeup. Um, and I could take, a, it's like a shader pen, which is an in- invisible ink pen, and, and dip it in the, the eyeshadow and color on the little color-shifting 100 in the corner. Um, and... Uh, there was uh, invis- they, they've got u- invisible ink UV pens, which like are basically marketed to like little girls' diaries. You know what I mean? You can write in the diary and nobody can read it, and then you shine the black light. And it- so I found those in red ink. So I'd uh, take a ruler over where the strip is and draw a line. That way, if, if anybody put the bills in a black light, the strip would appear to, to glow red as well. Um, so I knew, like, with all those features uh, beat, you know, there's really no way that anyone could prove that these bills were fake if they even suspected it, you know what I mean? Because it, it marks with the pen, it's got the strip and the watermark in it, color-shifting ink, it glows in the backlight. The, the only way that really you could tell is if you put it in a machine to check the magnetic ink, like a bill validator or uh, money counters at banks. So by the time the bills hit the bank, the bank would discover they were fake. But at that point, I, you know, it would be a week later. Nobody on the street could ever find out. No. <laughs> I've, I've had bankers. I, one time I went into a Chinese food restaurant and uh, went to break it. And it was this little old Chinese woman. She, like, she was holding it up and she wasn't sure. So she, she, one of her regular customers was a banker. And he was sitting over there. So she had, he's like, oh, is this bill real? And gave it to him. And he, he said it was real. So I've had a drug deal. I mean, one drug dealer, I, uh, I gave him a bill and told him that they were fake. I was like, you know, you want to start buying these from me? And he didn't believe me that, they, you know, that they were fake. Because once they mark with the, I mean, everybody just marks it with a pen or, you know, holds it up to look for a strip or a watermark or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. What does that actually do when they mark them with the pen? Basically, it's a, it, so it's a ink. In the pen, that's iodine based. Okay. That iodine reacts with starch, so all paper is treated with starch, except for you know currency money. Oh, okay. So if you if you mark any any regular paper, it'll mark black because the iodine reacts with that starch and turns black. Whereas real money doesn't, so it stays yellow. So it's just a way to you know okay. the pens are. You know, to detect counterfeit currency. Okay. But like I said, I, I would spray my bills with a, a lacquer. That's what the lacquer did. Yeah, so when you go to mark the, the paper, you're really not touching the paper because there's a, a clear coat of lacquer over it, it. to separate the, the pen from the paper. Okay. Um, it seems like uh, a very intricate process and a long, a long process. Like how, like when you started doing this at scale, like printing thousands and thousands of dollars, like I can't imagine what, like how would your process change? Like you're doing this with Bible paper still? Yeah. Um, and like the hardest part was acquiring the Bible paper, really. I would take road trips <laughs> all up the East Coast pretty much to go to cities, to go to bookstores and rip out blank pages because a Bible has like anywhere from two to 20 blank pages in the back usually. 
Um, so, you know, if you go into a, a Barnes & Noble or bookstore or whatever and open a Bible and I just have a little razor knife and cut 10 blank pages out, do that over and over again. Um, so say if there's five blank pages in each Bible and you're in a bookstore with 100 Bibles, you know, I mean, that's 500 pages, which is, you know, you could make 25, 50 grand off of one bookstore. Wow. So, but I mean, it got to the point where eventually I, I'd already been to every bookstore in <laughs> Knoxville, Chattanooga, Atlanta, up to Lexington, Cleveland. Holy shit. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, I was basically selling. I, I wanted to just sell these bills to, to people. And not use them? No, I did. I, I was nervous, you know what I mean? Because... Like, I knew, like, I would constantly, uh, you know, analyze these bills, always try and make them better, and, you know what I mean? But it, you kind of get in your head. You wonder, like, I think they look good, but you sit there and look at something all day, every day. You wonder if, you know. You're paying attention to the finest details exactly. of it, and you see everything that's wrong with them probably, right? Yeah. So the first time I went, I, I think, uh, for whatever reason, I just grew the balls, walked into a Taco Bell, and she held it up. And boom, cashed it, no problem. So, I was, okay, you know, <laughs> so I kind of started doing more shopping sprees. You know, what I mean, you hit up a couple more places, they take it, no problem. Every other time, they'd they'd either mark it with the pen or hold it up. A couple people sometimes would, you know, analyze it a little bit, but like I said, there's every feature is is beat. I mean, the bills looked pretty much perfect. You know what I mean? I changed all the serial numbers um, on each bill that way. You never had more than one bill with the same serial number. Um, you know, so, and, and there's different uh, different ways to, like, do it without getting caught, obviously. You know, you park in, like, a parking lot over here and, you know, walk a few hundred feet just so no cameras in the parking lot can maybe get your license plate or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you might park in one section over here and then like walk to a, a mall or a, in an area with lots of businesses and you could just hit up, you know, each business. So yeah, that was way more profitable than, I mean, I also sold them too. Right. Um, but you know, for $10,000, I could sell it for 2,500 or I could just go spend $10,000. Okay. You know, so once I got the confidence, like, yeah, these are all passing, no mm -hmm. problem. Uh, you know, I started doing both. <laughs> okay. Just selling them to multiple drug dealers throughout Knoxville. Um, it's buying prepaid visa cards, getting money orders. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? If I found, like, uh, prepaid visa cards have, like, a $3 fee added onto it. So if you get a $100 prepaid visa card, it'll be, like, $103, $104. So you give them two $100 bills, and you get $95 change and a $100 prepaid visa card. And if you go to, like, a Walmart and hit up, like, the electronic center register and the garden center and mm -hmm. a couple registers up front, I mean, you're making $1,000 just for mm -hmm. that, you know, that one Walmart. And I just hit up stores like that all day, every day for years. <laughs> At what point or was there a point where things kind of got sketchy or where to your – at the point where you're thinking in your head, like – this might be a little bit too good to be true. Like I got to start watching my back a little bit more like this. It, it can't be this. I can't be right. I, this gravy train is not going to last forever. Like, yeah. At what point did shit start to get go sideways? Um, well, my original plan was to, to just sell them to drug dealers basically. But ultimately I had a, a drug habit at the time as well. So a lot, a lot of it was ripping off drug dealers, you know, buying the heroin with it you know mm. so um most most of the guys I like i'd get one drug dealer for you know spend 500 bucks 500 bucks a thousand bucks you know until it kind of stacked up to where i got this guy for you know 10 grand five grand something like that um and usually the the guys weren't even mad if they did find out because they were able to i mean it was they just like money too, right yeah, yeah. They, they could go re-up they went to the store um, so a lot of the guys, if they did find out, they were just like, holy shit, you got me. Like, you know what I mean? Good job. And now they wanted to buy them from me because now they knew that they were fake. They'd be like, well, if you're going to buy five, that's yeah, a weird thing, right? It's kind of like you screwed me, but I didn't get screwed. Yeah. They, they respect the game, you yeah. know, I mean? they chalk it up as a loss, but they didn't really lose anything. So they were right. just, you know, impressed. They were like, oh shit, you made these. All right. Keep selling them to me. Or, or you know, maybe like I'd keep buying heroin from them. But instead of giving them $100 for a gram, 
I'd give them four hundred dollars for a gram mm. because they knew it was fake. Now you know, right. what I mean? so you right. kind of just do that. And if if see in in Knoxville, most of the the drug dealers are from out of town, like people from Detroit and Cleveland, Chicago, Atlanta, all go to Knoxville. Why is that? I think like bigger cities like Detroit, it seems like there's lots of drug dealers there. You know what I mean? So they just kind of branch out and go to these mid-level cities. You know what I mean? Knoxville's not big, but it's not small. There's money there. There's a lot of drug addicts there. So you've got a lot of people from out of town. Like, it's known in Knoxville that Detroit boys is what everybody calls them Detroit boys because it's just a group, a large group of people from Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was doing business with a lot of of those guys. Yeah, I mean, Tennessee is known for being, like, there's so many, there's so many, like, oxy documentaries yeah in tennessee it's crazy like just just the, like the opioid em- epidemic ripped through tennessee <laughs> like yeah, it's, it's no heroin else. now fentanyl. It's heroin. It's straight up heroin it's mm, fentanyl fentanyl really yeah people purposely taking fentanyl oh yeah for sure really i mean there are still people that kind of deny its existence you know oh, no this is real heroin <laughs> but it's all i mean what it's all the, real fent- or it's all fentanyl the crazy thing now that people are talking about is like people that are they say people that buy cocaine are accidentally overdosing on fentanyl. Yeah. But I saw like a, like it seems like a weird thing because fentanyl is the opposite of cocaine. Yeah. Right. So if somebody's overdosing on fentanyl and they're buying cocaine, it seems like it would be counterintuitive to the person that's selling that cocaine. Yeah, I agree. I'm not sure if there's, I mean, obviously there's cases where people overdose. Like you're not going to cut cocaine with fentanyl. No. Well, I your customers so. obviously aren't going to like that. The only reason I could think of is either A, because fentanyl is physically addictive. They might add a little bit in to get people like physically hooked on it. Mm. Or, or, I mean, fentanyl is so potent that like literally a tiny, like if you had fentanyl in a Ziploc bag right. and you poured it out to make your heroin or whatever, mm. And there was even residue left in that bag. If you then put cocaine in that bag, mm. there's still enough fentanyl to hurt someone that doesn't have a tolerance to it. Right. You know what I mean? So That's what I'm saying. It would make more sense that, like, if, say, so a drug dealer was selling... Because I know that they cut heroin with fentanyl, right? Yeah. So if, like, a drug dealer sold heroin and sold coke, maybe they cut it up on the same table and a little bit of fentanyl yeah, exactly. accidentally got into the cocaine. That would make sense. Yeah, for sure. But they would never purposely and you, cut... you got to think, people who are cutting heroin with fentanyl are probably cutting their coke too with, with something you know, else creatine like, or inositol or right, something so right. if they use the same blender to to mix up their products or you know i'm sure there's cases like that but mm. everything's circumstantial you know what i mean i'm sure i'm sure there's probably are people that do purposely throw fentanyl in it just to, who knows you know what yeah. I mean? but i think it's different cases for you know everybody just uh-huh. shit happens so people are are really fucked up on fentanyl in tennessee right now yeah, meth, meth and heroin. Well, they say, like I said, they say heroin. It's really, it's mostly fentanyl. Everything I've seen, it's like just plain white powder, which is heroin. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's it's pretty bad in in Knoxville. <laughs> meth too. Meth, meth is a a big one. Really? Oh yeah. When did fentanyl start becoming a big thing out there? Um. Well, or, I guess I'm, in the I'm country. from Tampa, so I mean, I it, the last eight years I've lived in Knoxville. And when I when I first moved there, it was still like pills, like Roxy's. Yeah. And, um, but they they just got too expensive. So I mean, I'd say I started noticing uh, fentanyl probably five six years ago. You know, mm. but it's like I mean, they say it's like ten times more potent than morphine, right? Oh, it's more than that. More I mean, than ten times. Well, there, there's different kinds too. There's like fentanyl, car fentanyl, and then there's other designer, you know, U four seven seven zero zero, which is oh. like just you know random designer drugs Mm -hmm. but yeah they're super strong opiates nowadays they make in china and ship over here and but (sighs) knoxville is bad like if you walk to a gas station you'll probably have one or two people pull up and offer you heroin really yeah yeah Yeah, so that i mean that uh, was good as far as having counterfeit money strangers come up to you and offer to sell you drugs of course you're gonna i'll buy some and give them fake money yeah you know what i mean right for sure especially if you're never gonna see him again right yeah well i mean i try to keep doing business with them but there was also like sketchy points when you know you wonder if they did find out if they're pissed off you don't want to call them the next day to buy more Mm -hmm. if they found out so you really have to you know read people over the phone Mm -hmm. like i said in my case luckily most people uh you know, weren't angry, 
You know what I mean? Right. There was one guy that the guy that actually ultimately set me up and uh, with the the feds. Um, when I first met him, I was uh, basically like my roommate. Uh, roommate, this girl uh, was getting heroin from him. Uh, you know, with my money, and uh, we got him for probably. I'd say close to 10 grand over the course of like a few weeks or something. Um, and I guess he's uh, one of his, the bills was in his pocket and it was raining. So that, that color shifting, the makeup that I paint on wiped mm. off cause it got wet. So he ultimately found out that the bills were fake. Um, and I, I pulled in my driveway one day and he was standing in my driveway, like yelling at my roommate. So I'm like, Oh fuck, like, this is going to be a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but he didn't know that they were coming for me. He was because she was the one getting it. So I just walked by and hear him yell. You know, he's like, I don't care. I'm not mad. I just want to know where the fuck you got him from. You know what I mean? So when I heard that, I, just, you know, I started selling them to him. You know what I mean? I basically oh, said, really? like, listen, they're coming for me. You know, I'll sell them to you for, you know, 20, 25 cents on the dollar. <clears throat> so he was buying anywhere from five ten thousand dollars worth every time he'd go up to cleveland to to re-up like he'd go and pick up a, a brick a kilo of heroin or whatever usually cut it to two but nonetheless he'd want at least like 10 grand worth of my bills to to mix in with you know his real money really <clears throat> so he would give you 10 grand and you would give him 40 grand no, I never did that much. It was more like I'd give him ten, and he'd give me twenty five hundred. Oh, or, okay. I mean, I had multiple different people that I was doing those mm-hmm. kind of deals with. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but you know, he'd normally buy like a, a brick at a time. So you know, if he was spending forty grand, he'd want ten, maybe fifteen thousand of my money to mix in with it. You know what I mean? So mm. we were mixing in this fake money with real money. God. So there, I mean, it's hard to. It's you couldn't tell that the bills were fake if I handed you one and told you they were fake. Let alone mixing it in with you know forty thousand dollars of other real money right. and just mix it in randomly. You yeah. Know? And so I had uh, a couple different, like a group of a couple different guys from Cleveland, <clears throat> probably about five different guys uh, from Detroit, a um, couple guys from Atlanta. And then, you know, there's random other people that were from Knoxville, but, you know, so. So you said this is the guy that initially set you up? Yeah. Eventually, he was the one. Um, how so, how far into this shit did you get before he set you up? Like, how long did you, were you working with him? Uh, with I was doing the counterfeiting thing for about two years. I think he came in the picture probably the last... I want to say six, eight months. Like we had a good, uh, you know, so like, like I said, the Bible paper thing, um, it was hard to come by. So after going to bookstores and all that, so I basically I was, went to a hotel one day and went in the, the end table to get the Bible to, you know, get a couple pieces of paper out of it or whatever. Um, and there wasn't there. So I, I waved down the maintenance man and was like, Hey, I, there's not a Bible in my room. Can you get me a Bible? <laughs> So he was like, yeah, I'll get you one. I'll be right back. I was like, you know what? You guys not keep Bibles in the nightstand anymore? And he's like, no, we stopped doing that. I got boxes full of Bibles in the maintenance closet. So I was like, you know, I'm like, give me those boxes. I'll pay you for those boxes. You know what I mean? I got a lot of praying to do that. <laughs> and that that particular guy, actually, like, I, I think I gave him like a hundred bucks for all these boxes of Bibles or something. Mm-hmm. Um and so I got them in the room. There's probably like five boxes. I went through, t- took all the blank pages, and then just went through the boxes in the dumpster. You know what I mean? So he noticed that, and he was like, I remember he was like asking me, like, why the fuck did you just pay me for these Bibles and then throw them away? You know, it didn't make sense to him. But, but yeah, so we started uh, basically paying maintenance men at different hotels to, to, you know, bring me boxes of Bibles, which that definitely increased the, the production, you mm. know. So... This guy was going up to Cleveland. How many bills could you fit into one Bible page? Uh, it dep- like your your typical Bible about like this that that you'd find in a hotel room or something. It's just one side per page. So like, cause I'm printing the front and the back. Mm. So like those, you know, at a <clears throat> there's usually like about four pages in those little Bibles. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's worth two hundred bucks. So it's not. That you needed to get lots of them, but there there's other specific types of of Bibles, like for instance the Jeremiah Study Bible, 
specifically. It's, it's a study Bible, so the back was full of blank pages to take notes on. It said, like, notes at the top, and it was just, like, 30 blank pages. And the Bible was probably, you know, this big. Notes. So We're printing you, notes all right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you could fit probably three sides, like a front, a back, and another front on one page. And, you know, there was, say, 40 blank pages. So, you know, what's, what is that? 40 times, uh, times three, 120. I mean, the one Bible's worth about 10 grand. Okay. You know what I mean? So, like, if you go and do a, a Barnes & Noble, for instance, there's probably two or three copies of the Jeremiah Study Bible and get those. And then, you know, random other ones. I mean, like I said, a bookstore, you could probably get about, say, 50, at least 50,000 worth of paper from one bookstore. Okay. But most cities only have, like, two bookstores in the city. Right. You know what I mean? So you go to Chattanooga, but you hit the two bookstores there, you know, that's 50, 50, $100,000 out of Chattanooga. You know, you go to Atlanta, there's, say, three bookstores there. There's 150 out of Atlanta. But it comes to a point to where I went to Atlanta, Chattanooga, Knoxville, mm-hmm. you know, Sevierville, <clears throat> uh, Lexington, Cleveland. You know, you just because when you're busting these bills, you also want to travel around. You know, I mean, I think I, I think the number that I spent in Knoxville was like three hundred and eighty thousand uh, dollars throughout businesses in Knoxville, which that I got a little ballsy. You, you spent I mean? three hundred and eighty thousand not yeah. just on Bibles, but like spending the money. No, just yeah, shopping. But wow. to bust to, to convert that money into, you know, real money. You'd go <sighs> shopping, you'd buy something for ten, twenty bucks. What kind of shit were you buying? Oh, uh, just random shit. Like at the time, you know, I had a, a heroin habit. So yeah. it was converted to cash <laughs> and then, you know, I'd buy visa cards to pay for the hotel rooms and you know, had some designer bags, jewelry, shit like that. I mean nothing was no like Ferraris. But, no. you know, no. I mean, you know, just living, living comfortably. Right. For right. Sure. Wow. So how did this guy eventually set you up? Um, so one day he told me, he was like, oh, I, I bought this, uh, it was, a, I think, a 2009 Charger or something. I guess one of these dudes that uh, was buying dope from him was like, oh, he <laughs> sold him a car for, like, I think it was $500 and an eight ball of heroin. For a 2009 Charger. So I was like, bro, that's a stolen car. 100%. He's like, no, the guy gave me a title. He's like, it's all good. I'm going to go register it. I was like, bro, you bought that from a junkie for $500, bro. <laughs> it's a fucking stolen car. <laughs> Promise you. Either way, he, he was convinced because he, he had the title. The guy has the title. So, sold it to him. so mm. I was supposed to uh, go up to Cleveland with him um, to, you know, we had maintenance guy that was going to give us some Bibles up there. Uh, I was going to, you know, bust bills throughout the city while he re-upped on some dope. Um, but, like, the day before we were supposed to leave, I ended up getting arrested for a, a failure to appear, like a little little warrant I had. Um, so I got arrested the next day, bond out, but he already went without me, I guess. So uh, we were renting a house together, um, and I was kind of you know printing the money out of the back and he was selling selling dope out of the front and we shared this house so i bond out of jail on that little charge and i go home and his little runner chick summer uh she basically said like oh he went up to cleveland without you so i was like okay whatever you know what i mean and then she basically said like don't uh you know he told me not to tell you this but he got arrested up in cleveland so Instantly, I was like, you know, why would he, why would he tell you not to tell me? Like that's sketchy, you know. It's a red flag for sure. Um, and I knew I, at first, I, I, I figured it was probably that car. I'm like, I knew that car was stolen, you know what I mean? But I also knew he was going up there with, he had twenty thousand in real cash and five thousand in my bills at the time. So I knew, you know, whether it was because of the car or not he most likely got caught with, you know, counterfeit money or heroin, one of the two, you know. And, uh, you know, by him telling her not to tell me that he got arrested is, in my mind, he's cooperating, you know, and trying to, he's going to set me up or attempt to at some point. So Mm -hmm. um, I got, you know, my computers and printers, and I had ventilation fans to to spray the lacquer indoors. It would suck it out the window. You had, like, a whole, like, like production studio. counterfeiting little setup, you know what I mean? But... When I found out he was locked up, I got everything and went to a hotel. I was like, fuck this, I'm leaving. Um, which I'm 
Well, I mean, I'm glad I did, but ultimately I got arrested anyway. But um, so I'm staying in a hotel, um, and uh, this other group of Detroit guys put in like an order for like six thousand dollars. So I was, my plan was to to wake up, make this six thousand to give these Detroit guys. My you know my wife at the time was gonna go shopping, whatever. It was just like a normal day every day. Um, and this dude E, the guy from Cleveland, calls me. So he basically was like, hey, I, I've got these, that book, a uh, uh, box of Bibles for you. And I was like, well, just hold on to him. I don't want to meet up right now. You know what I mean? Like, I assume he's cooperating. Um, and he basically said, I was like, eventually, basically, I was like, wow, you know, you just got arrested. Why didn't you tell me that? You know what I mean? Like, why did you tell Summer not to tell me, bro? You're acting, you're acting fucking sketchy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he had this story, which kind of made sense, but I still didn't trust him. You know, he basically said, yeah, that car was stolen. I got arrested for it. The money I was going to use to buy the dope, I had to bond out with. So I couldn't re-up in Cleveland. So now I'm back in Knoxville and I need to re-up. Can you get me like a, a 700 grams from your Detroit people? Which is like, I don't sell, you know, I didn't really sell a, a lot of drugs like that. You know what I mean? So for him to ask me that <clears throat> over the phone... After he just got out of jail, like, it was a huge red flag. And he's tra- he's trying to set me up for things that I don't even do. You know what right. I mean? Like, I'm doing the counterfeiting thing. It, um, so, basically, like, he asked me that, and I was like, listen, bro, like, we're not having this conversation, especially not over the phone. You know, what are you talking about? You're the drug dealer. I'm not. Goodbye. So, you know, I hang up. <clears throat> um, I guess the they GPS pinged my phone, though, to my location. So, they knew... They didn't know which room I was in, but they knew that I was in the extended stay hotel in West Knoxville. So, you know, like I said, that next morning, my wife's going to go shopping. I was going to, you know, print 6000 for this guy. So they leave. <clears throat> and I didn't know this at the time, but I guess as soon as my wife got in the car and started to pull out, they swarmed her. You know what I mean? The police. It was the Knox, uh, KPD... Organized Crime Unit, Drug Task Force, Cleveland Secret Service, Knoxville Secret Service, you know, multiple different agencies. Uh, so, basically, I but I didn't know this. My wife just left to go shopping, you know. So, I'm in there <laughs> hanging paper, spraying it, cutting, printing, all this stuff. And I, I hear a knock on the door. And I, you know, look through the peephole. Uh, and it's just black. Like, somebody's thumb was over the peephole. So at first I was thinking like, oh, these is like maybe somebody's trying to rob me or something. I, I didn't know because, but I look out the window and I saw a line of Knox County sheriffs. <laughs> you know what I mean? So oh fuck yeah, I go to to flush some of the the money that I was printing. I threw a bunch in the toilet and flushed it. You know, went down, threw a bunch more in, went to flush it, and they shut the water off because they thought I had a bunch of kilos of drugs in there and stuff. Oh uh, okay. <clears throat> so there was a bunch of one-sided like unfinished counterfeit money all in the toilet and fucking so the toilet wouldn't flush hmm. it did the first time but the second time i guess no good but i mean at that point i i was already in there with you know i'm in a hotel room there's nowhere to go what kind of shit did you have in there you had printers in there Uh, yeah printers computers uh you know all the different sprays my little glass light board to like cut everything on and line everything up with and the worst part was the the files on the computer, you know, because I mean? oh, really? all of those serial numbers, I changed every serial number. So when they got the computer as evidence, that basically linked me to all these different serial numbers that they found throughout the country. Yeah, no so that was that was a wrap at that point. <laughs> so what was going through your head, bro, when you were trying to flush that stuff? Oh, wasn't going, and you knew those sheriffs were outside. Yeah. Like what? Panic attack. And then those doors at that hotel was like steel reinforced, so like it took them a long time to kick it in it just, oh really so, i mean it took about five minutes so you wouldn't open you didn't open it hell no i mean i, I you know what'd you do why they were trying I'm to kick just, it in i think i just sat there <laughs> and smoked a cigarette and i was like <laughs> man what am I, you know what are you gonna do at that point i think once they started kicking in the door it was already like bent and fucked up so you probably couldn't open it if you know if i wanted so I mean, you just sit there and wait for them you know but yeah they charged me on uh <clears throat> originally or at first it was state charges uh, until the the feds could compile evidence and all because they didn't know who i was until that guy e told them like two days before that and then they came down from cleveland to set me up 
So, so they, you didn't have any drugs on you when they busted through the door? Uh, I think there was a couple of grams, but nothing like heard, like no, 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 distrib no. like distrib No, no. I, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't selling drugs. You know what I mean? So when they busted through the door, then what happened? Like what they say to you? What they you know, do to you? Slam your ass on the ground and <laughs> handcuff me. <clears throat> uh, you know, they told me we've got you know your your wife outside. She's in custody. There was, you know, an army, like, just so many cops everywhere, you know what I mean? Um, they they took me in on, on state charges of criminal simulation over 60000 Um And, you know, I think it took, like, two and a half, three months for the, the feds to finally compile all their evidence because they went and got a warrant to go through the computer, you know what I mean? get all the, the evidence they needed and then they served me an indictment uh, about mm. two and a half three months later wow so you were sitting in like uh just like a state prison before no, that at, like, at first it was just knox county jail you were just in a jail just like the yeah. local jail yeah for months and then the when the feds got involved then what happened like did what changed once the once the fbi got involved well, it's it's a secret service. Oh, it's um, a secret they, service. They handle like Forgot financial about, they crimes. They handle, and, handle the money shit, right? Um, but yeah, basically, they took me to, <clears throat> to court one day, and my public defender was like, you know, they're they're dropping their charges on you, <laughs> but I because I knew the state or the feds were going to pick them up. You know, what I mean, if the mm. state drops them, it's mm. so basically they you know went to court. The state dropped all charges, and then they walked me across the street to the federal marshal building. And they served me in the indictment for the conspiracy. At first, it was a five-count indictment for, uh, let's see, it was conspiracy to counterfeit U.S. obligations, uh, like a couple counts of uttering U.S. obligations, um, and I think it was like sale and manufacture of counterfeit U.S. Uh, obligations. Mm. So, that, you know, eventually I pled to just one count of the conspiracy to counterfeit. Cause they'd, all, they'd all run you know, concurrent anyway. So they basically just give you the biggest charge and, right. you know, drop the other ones. But So what did they charge you with? They charged you, they gave you one charge, and how long did they sentence you well, for? Well, originally, uh, in the feds, it's like a, it's a range. You know what I mean? Right. You, you get like, you know, 12 to 18 months or, <clears> you know, <throat> so it's like, um, originally I was looking at, it was like three years, about give or take. Um, so... They, they came to me with this deal and said, uh, if you can, uh, you know, plead guilty and show us how you made these bills, make a, make a video to train future agents, um, you know, basically just to explain all the evidence, what it was, how I learned about it, you know, all that, um, and, and make a training video for future Secret Service agents, then they would not charge my wife and keep the restitution amount under a hundred thousand dollars because that's an enhancement so once it once it was once you make more than a hundred thousand dollars you get more time mm. you know what i mean because mm. it's like an enhancement in the feds so <clears throat> they basically said they were like at this point we found three hundred and eighty thousand dollars in knoxville we're still finding about 10 grand a week coming in through the bank so they were like if you plead guilty now we'll keep it at under a hundred um, and not charge your wife. So basically I made like a, a video. They f flew a film crew down <laughs> to Knoxville and like filmed me making bills. <laughs> really? In the Secret Service headquarters. Really? Yeah. What was that like? So you were in uh, prison while you had to film this, right? Like you were still doing your time? No, no. This was, they oh. actually, well, they let me out on pretrial release for uh, some months before I was sentenced, okay. and that's when I did all that. So the Secret Service flew a film crew down to mm -hmm. your house? To the Secret Service headquarters. Oh, the Secret Service headquarters. Knoxville. You met them there? Yeah. Did you, like, how did you, did they, did you have to give them, like, a list of equipment and shit, or, like, how did that work? Uh, basically, they <clears> just <throat> went through and asked me, like, exactly, you know, what certain chemicals were, why I had certain things, what did I, you know, use them for, how did I find out that I could use them for, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because um, I had, I would always experiment with stuff, trying to make the bills better, you know what I mean? So I had, like, the, the that makeup, right, the, that I made the color-shifting pigment out of. There was one kind that was the best, but I had, like, a bunch of other ones because I'd experiment, and I was... Uh, 
working on doing the new blue notes as well and that's got a different color shift uh mm -hmm. so i had stuff to match that color shifting I, a certain type of nail polish mixed in with a, a color shifting pigment i got online if you mix them together it makes a perfect copper to gold mm -hmm. like on the new hundreds um so there was stuff like that and uh like i found a uh it's like a fine tip ballpoint glue pen so it it it's like a regular Bic pen, except it pushes out glue instead of ink. Hmm. So, like, some people, to test if a bill's <clears throat> real, they'll scratch the shirt, is what they say, which means you feel the texture. You know, you kind of run your fingernail along his, his T-shirt on the portrait of the president right. to, to feel the texture. So I've, I ran across a couple cashiers that would do that. Um, so I, I had this little glue pen that I'd draw little lines on real quick to give this rigid texture on the mm. shirt just weird like little things like that that they've never the secret service hasn't seen before or, or was wondering why i had you know this these pens or this you know this or that basically yeah um and you know i basically took my my computer you know printed a, a couple bills glued them sprayed the lacquer you know explained what i was doing and uh you know they counted that as as cooperation to to give me from three years, it got knocked down to 10 months. Wow. Yeah. 10 months. Mm -hmm. It seems like, I mean, obviously it's a long fucking time, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem like that long for all the shit that you were doing. Um, I mean, no, it's, <laughs> it, it was definitely a, a blessing, you know, because yeah. I, I, there was drug dealers that I, I met in multiple ones that I would, they'd find out the bills were fake after I was ripping them off or whatever, and I'd, I'd offer to sell them sell them the bills, and they'd be like, no, I don't want to fuck with that. You know what I mean? That's serious shit. And it's like, there are people, you know, trafficking kilos of heroin with guns on them and stuff, and they're, mm. <laughs> they're worried about right. kind of for bills, you know? Right. I mean? You weren't so, doing anything violent, so. No, yeah. So, I mean, the, the time for, I mean, it's, it's a white-collar crime, so most, mm. most white-collar crimes don't look at, at nearly as much time as drugs and guns. They don't, they don't like drugs and guns so how long did the process take for you to film that training video for the secret service uh it was probably like two two hours two hours. hours and how many bills did you make for them oh uh, just two just two mm -hmm. i didn't know at the time my my lawyer was pregnant at the time i felt bad after the fact because i was showing him everything and then i take this lacquer spray can <laughs> and i start spraying it and she was like oh i gotta leave the room and like ran out and i didn't think i was like oh i'm sorry it smells you know what i mean but later I found out that she was pregnant, so I felt bad about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? But but she is all good with it. Oh my god, that's so wild. So what? What? Uh, so you only did ten months. Mm -hmm. What was the ten months like? Um, was it a low low security? Yeah. Well, it was it was a, a administrative mm. facility, which like is, a camp. No, it wasn't a camp. It was a it's a low security basically. There's camps, lows, you know, mm -hmm. uh, medium and highs, but. Uh, I went, uh, I was in, I got sentenced and I had to sit in Knox County jail for, you know, a couple of weeks. And then they sent me to Blunt County jail, which is the federal holding facility for East Tennessee. Sat there for like a month. Um, then they shipped me to, uh, London, Kentucky, uh, Laurel County is like another federal holding facility. It's just kind of a holdover until they get you to the, the compound. Um, and then they sent me to FMC Lexington which is, like I said, it's, it's an administrative low, so it, it houses low, medium, and highs, mm. but it's essentially a low, low security. Um, and, you know, it wasn't bad. Shot some pool, you know, worked out a little bit. <laughs> really? Yeah. What kind of guys did you meet in there? Uh, Matt Cox type people? No, not. Fraudsters? Not. I, no? was, I was one of the few, there was a couple guys that, uh, did what well, one dude was doing credit card fraud i think okay uh he was like he owned a company and <clears throat> was like basically like overcharging people who you know gave him his credit card like bought a product from him and then he'd like overcharge them and then refund them and he had some kind of scam to mm -hmm. where he right. made it made out on top uh and uh man in in lexington kentucky it was mostly drugs and guns um you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There weren't a lot of white. I was one of the few, like, white-collar uh, criminals. I was the only counterfeiter there. Really? Well, actually, there was one guy that was counterfeiting checks. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's super rare for people to counterfeit 
that yeah. amount of bills, right? Like you're, you said yeah. in the beginning of this that you were one of like how many that have been that have served federal time for doing that? Oh, well, there, there's a lot of people that have have served time for counterfeiting, but most in the Secret Service told me this. They they said they were like you're the one, these are the best bills we've seen in 25 years. Really? And he was like the the majority of all their counterfeiting cases are like you know teenagers you know just photocopying you know mm-hmm. just, and they don't look good and they usually print a thousand dollars and then get caught and then you know what i mean so right. the there's not a lot of like professional counterfeiters out there you know right. I, mean, I only know of like two you know matt was saying he he did the 12 years and he said i think he's only met one or two and they that's were, what he told me today he's like yeah i've met two people ever that yeah. have done this I, and, and they this. were probably just you know photocopying bills you mm-hmm. know what i mean so like it's hard to to print money because the printers recognize if you try to just print a bill, the the printer will recognize it and it won't allow you to print. You know what I mean? So you can go and do a photocopier machine and just make a copy, but then they're going to look horrible. You know what I mean? So um, I got around that by instead of scanning the bill, because if you scan it, it'll just put some like penal code as to why you're not allowed to scan bill money or whatever. So I'd take a, a high resolution camera and take a photo of it and then upload that photo and then adjust, you know, go take it to a Adobe Photoshop, the photo and edit everything and layer it. I layered it into three different images. So when you went to print it, you weren't just printing one bill. So, the, you know, the, the printer couldn't recognize it. I'd print like just the background color and then I'd print all the black work over it and then I'd print the treasury seal and serial numbers. So it was multiple different prints. You printed each layer separately. Yeah. So the, the printer couldn't recognize that I was printing money. You know what I mean? So it kind of got around. So that. how many layers total? And then so you'd print how many layers of this Bible paper? Uh, well, I mean layers is in like digital. Right. La- like on Adobe, I'd break it to f- three different pictures. You know, right. one was just the background color. Um, the fr- basically the front of the bills had three different prints. I'd print three times just okay. for the front of the bill. Okay. And then the back of the bill, I did two prints. So just oh, on the one. same piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. So like you're just printing a background color first. So it's just a, that beige color of money. Mm-hmm. It's just a solid rectangle of that color. And then you put it back in the printer and print all the, the ink, you know, the black mm-hmm. stuff. And then put it through again and print the treasury seal and serial numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was three prints for the front two prints for the back and then one print for the strip and the watermark wow yeah so that was tricky i had to like in order to print because the bible paper is too too thin it'll jam up in the printer Mm -hmm. you know i mean so you have to tape it onto a piece of of regular printer paper so it's you know thick enough to go through and be printed on right so like i'd always me and my wife would stay up all night just taping bible paper to print until we had a stack like this you know what i mean and then the next day we'd just run them all through and print them out um you know so it's hard it's hard to basically counterfeit i mean most people when they found out the bills were fake or or you know f- knew what i was doing they'd instantly be like i want you know sell me a million dollars worth and it's like you know each bill you're literally handcrafting you know what i mean right. you're, you're print it's saying multiple prints and then you got to cut them out, spray them with, you know, if you spray too much Gorilla Glue, it'll fuck up and be too thick. If right. you don't spray enough, it'll, the, the pieces will separate. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, it, it became a, a fine art of, mm. you know, spraying just the right amount, gluing them together, making sure they're lined up, and then spraying the lacquer, a thick coat first, a thinner coat to give it that texture. Mm-hmm. You don't want to spray too much lacquer because then it'll be too thick. It'll, it won't feel right. So, I mean, it was a real, like, fine-tooth process of, uh, you know, getting them just right. But after doing it, after about three, four, five months, I got to where, you know, it would take me, I could probably make, like, a perfect counterfeit 110 minutes. Really? And so, usually every day I'd make at least, even if nobody had any orders or anything, I'd make at least 25 bills, 2500 bucks every day. And that was just like the money I needed to survive. You know what I mean? I was spending at least 2500 a day on a, Really? Yeah. On, on drugs? Well, not all drugs, but you know, I'd buy, buy my drugs for the day. You know, we had this nanny that was working for us that, you know, and hotel rooms, out to dinners. 2500 you know. bucks a day. That's a lot. 
You're like well, the Tinder swindler. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I haven't seen that. I'd like to watch that. <laughs> oh my god, it's fucking um, insane. But you got to think twenty five hundred in counterfeit hundreds, like in order to bust that and convert it to real money. You know, you're you're going and buying something for ten dollars, twenty dollars. Mm. So you know, you buy some worthless shit for twenty dollars. You don't need just to bust that bill. Just to bust it, right? So out of that twenty five hundred, you know, you're you're really getting a bunch of shit from Walmart and whatever that you you know may need, you may not need, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But so you're you're probably getting you know two thousand out of that twenty five hundred, mm-hmm. even even just spending them at stores, right? So, but yeah, two thousand a day was kind of my standard minimum amount of. <laughs> has anybody uh, ever since you got out? Has anyone asked you for any uh, like custom artwork or something, or like uh, no custom artwork of currency? I've, I've had some people want me to start counterfeiting. You know, again, they, yeah. Oh like, shit! Oh, you can do because they find out my story and find out you know, and they want me to oh, sell them. But you should break make more and sell them. But I, you know, I'm not. Trying what to. have you? Uh, do you still like run in the same circles? Like have the same talk to the same people, or has it been like difficult yeah. to kind of like? like recalibrate your life since you got out yeah i mean i uh yeah no i'm i'm sober now i've been sober for like uh, two years now so i don't really associate with (laughs) any of those people anymore it was mostly just like drug dealers and Mm. you know so do you uh, think you would have got i mean you probably wouldn't got sober if you didn't go to prison right probably not probably not i mean honestly it it definitely helped you know, all around. It was, it was for the best. You know what I mean? I was kind of living a crazy life yeah. uh, for a long time. So, Has it been hard to adjust since you've gotten out? Like, like, has it been difficult to, like, find a place to live, to get work? And, like, what's that been like? Well, I, I just got out, like, three months ago. So, oh, did you really? Yeah. Um, but luckily, I, I found uh, a good job, man. Uh, it's working at a print shop. So, <laughs> yeah. I, uh... You know, and I was honest with them up front. I told them, like, listen, I'm on, you know, supervised release right. for counterfeiting. And, you know, they're they're all cool guys where I work. So they, I mean, obviously, your skill with, like, graphic design, Photoshop, and that kind of shit, right? Do they yeah, respect that and be like, yeah, wow, yeah, you, you mean, can actually, like, yeah. apply that to something, something and, useful? And I've been in that, that trade. Like, I was in the sign business before. So oh, okay. signs and graphics are all pretty related, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I've worked at a couple print shops, vinyl shops beforehand. So mm-hmm. I've got experience in it on top of the, you know, illegal experience. But, mm. um, but yeah, they were, you know, they hired me and they're they're really cool. Understanding if I have to, you know, miss work to go to probation or whatever, they're, yeah. they're all good, man. I have really lucked out with that job. Have you ever talked to uh, or met any, obviously, I think you said mentioned that you met a guy in prison that did uh, counterfeit credit cards. Did uh, Matt mention that guy John Boziak to you? Yeah, we we talked about him. He showed me a little uh, sizzle reel or something for a, oh, okay. a okay. documentary or something he's putting out. Yeah, he was he was doing something similar to what you were doing, where he yeah. was in a room basically printing out and forging credit cards. Yeah, I've, I've I saw actually I think I saw the concrete episode. Oh, did him. you really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's his story was fucking crazy. Yeah, I mean once like he was I'm sure doing the same thing as far as like once you. You can beat all those little security features. I mean, mm-hmm. it ends up being perfect. You know what I mean? They just, and that's what the bills were like. I mean, if you've got a credit card with a hologram and embro- or embossed and, you know, everything right, mm-hmm. then people, and, and it works. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why would anyone think that it was fake? You know what I mean? It's just right. success. You right. know what I mean? That's, that's what the bills, you know, ended up being. It's just like they worked every time. Yeah. You know what I mean? The only times that I ever got turned down was if I went to, like, a Walmart like, too many times, and I'd keep going, keep going, and then they'd, you know, eventually they'd hit the bank, and the bank would inform management, and then management, like, one time I went into a, a grocery store, and I gave this bill to this cashier, she broke it, like, a week later, I happened to go back to the same grocery store, and it was the same cashier, I recognized her, and she, this time I handed her the bill, and she held it up and was looking at the strip and the watermark, marked it with a pen, held it up again. And I was like, you know, was there a problem? Like, you know, and she's like, oh, yeah, we just, uh, I got a counterfeit bill last week, so I'm just double-checking everything. And I was like, okay. And she still accepted it, you know what I mean? So, like, and that happened a few different times. People Mm -hmm. would say, like, oh, we've been getting counterfeit bills. But, I mean, if you mark it with the pen. They don't remember where they got it from. Well, yeah. I mean, and it, they're passing all the tests. There are certain tests a cashier does to, mm-hmm. you know, 
see if it's real or not. And right. I, you know, everything was legitimate. You know, right. it all looked legitimate. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there were times to get like money orders and give them. You know, I've got the little victim list or whatever with all all the the bills that they found. You know, at different businesses, uh-huh. and there's some like you get Western Union for twelve, fifteen hundred dollars, or there was one case where we knew uh, the manager at a, a gas station that would just open the safe and just switch out, you know, f- fake bills for real bills. Oh shit! Yeah, so there's a bunch of different like little scams or ways to get them off. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's an interesting. It's a really like unique thing because. It's like it doesn't really hurt one specific person. You can kind of like pass it along. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like everyone can kind of benefit from it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it wasn't. I wasn't making enough money to like actually affect the economy. Right. As a whole. Exactly. Right. So really, I mean, what is? I mean, if if, if everyone thinks it's real, it looks real, and it passes everywhere. Like essentially, it's right. who you know, are you hurting? Look the right? other way. You right. I mean? You're not really hurting anybody, are you? <laughs> well, the judge seemed to think so. The judge but, thought so. Know, and, and the the judge was really religious, so she didn't really like the uh, oh. the Bible paper thing. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, I actually got arrested one time at a a Walmart for theft because <laughs> I was stealing Bible paper. Like I went in, like ripped a couple pages. They arrested of Bible you paper. for ripping the Bible paper out. Well, they uh, they saw me. They they pull me aside and say, "Oh, we saw you stuff something in your pants." You know what I mean? Because I just put it in like you know, the top of my pants after, you know, I took a Bible, took out some blank pages and tucked it in my pants. And they were like, you know, we know you're stealing something. We saw you stuff something in your pants. Um, and finally they, they like took it out and just saw a bunch of blank pages of fucking Bible paper. They're like, what is this? Like, why are you doing this? And I didn't know what to tell them. You know what I mean? I can't admit to what I'm actually right. doing with it. So I was just like, oh, I don't know what to tell you, bro. I probably looked fucking crazy. You know what I mean? But, yeah, they just gave me a little citation for a theft or whatever. Oh, but okay. They didn't know, you know, why I was right. ripping up blank <laughs> pages and stuff in my pants. It's kind of embarrassing, but. That's insane. Yeah. Um, so, are you, like, paying back a certain amount of your, your income to restitution right now? Yeah. Or? Uh, the restitution, like I said, they kept it under 100000 So, mm-hmm. I think it's, like, 96000 some odd dollars that I, I got to pay back. They don't make it easy to bounce back, man. Well, no, nah, I mean, it's it's only been three months I've been out, and, yeah, it's not easy, for sure. Uh, I'm still living in a halfway house. Are you? Yeah, because me and my wife separated while I was in prison, so I had to, basically, the house that I was going to go to in North Carolina, I couldn't because we were separating, so they had to send me back to the sentencing district. So mm. I originally caught my charges in Knoxville, so I had to go back to Knoxville. Fuck. So they took my car, I got no place, you know, so I just had to go to a halfway house, you know what I mean? But luckily I, I landed that job and, you know, I, I'll get back on my feet mm-hmm. here soon. But Well, cool, bro. I really appreciate you coming down here and uh, and telling your story, man. I'm sure people are going to love it. Tell if uh, Is there a place that people can, like, find you if they want to, like, reach out to you or? Um, I mean, I'm on Facebook. I was talking to Matt about starting a, a podcast, maybe, you know, dealing yeah. with, uh, you know, fraud and white collar crimes yeah. and stuff, but yeah, you should. I haven't gotten to it yet. I've been out three months, but I'm I'm a I'm a work to everything. So people want to like hit you up or, or or talk to you, or they can hit you up on Facebook. Yeah, Jeff Turner on Facebook. Cool, awesome, Jeff. Well, uh, thanks again, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.